<laughs> Yo Snapchat, I just realized that doing daily videos, you guys are gonna get way too much insight into my psychology, but I guess like it'll be good because future generations can kind of look back and see the development and the ideas and the insights. So we're predicting the future and trying to come up with these elaborate visions of what uh, worlds we could live in in the future. Obviously technology is a massive driver. I mean, you look at like smartphones, that kind of drove a lot of societal change that we're seeing right now. But the other major factor which I try to stay away from is human psychology because it's icky and like, you know, it's hard to predict and humans are weird. Um, <laughs> but obviously like humans have to adopt all these technologies for them to have an impact. An interesting thought experiment is um, perhaps like the chicken and egg problem applied to like technology and human psychology, like which one came first, which one preceded that change, that movement. So right now basically everyone has a smartphone in their pocket, we're all looking down like cyborg zombies the entire time. But the question is like, um, did the technology kind of precede people's value, people's adoption of that, or was it the other way around? Like sure, most people couldn't live without a smartphone now, I mean um, most people constantly are within, within arm's reach of their smartphone basically 24-7, but it wasn't always that case, I remember living through that. So I remember I got my first smartphone in either uh, first or second year uni, which would have been like 2006 or 2007, Android of course, um, but I'm pretty sure I was the first of my friends to have a smartphone, and that's interesting. And while my memory's probably biased, because people suck at remembering things in the past, um, I have a feeling that most of my friends thought that um, there was no point in having a smartphone, they're too expensive, why would you need one? But obviously like once the technology improves and once one person gets a smartphone, another one gets a smartphone, it's kind of a very viral thing. Remember when the iPhone first came out, everyone was like, wow, look, you got an iPhone, can I play with it? What is it? What? So the point here is that I think technology doesn't just happen and then everyone like immediately adopts it, like obviously. Um, it's more of like everyone tells each other a story and a narrative of like how they could live and what this thing could do. And even before that technology is available, obviously you're still going to make, um, make up stories about how this technology could transform people's lives and why we should make it and how we should make it and what features it should have. I mean, you could probably argue that the development of the first iPhone wasn't so much like a couple of year development cycle within Apple, it was actually a story we've been telling each other since Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in 1876. And so now that we all have smartphones, it's kind of like we're all living out that narrative that people have thought of decades before, even like over a hundred years ago. Um, and so we're living in this make-believe world. <laughs> people were perfectly happy and lived fulfilling lives before the invention of the smartphone, but it's almost like now that we can't live without the smartphone, we've kind of like reinvented the rules. We're playing a different game, a make-believe game. So now apply this concept to everything else in society, everything we do on a daily basis. I feel like nothing is real, nothing's necessary, it's all a make-believe game we play, therefore you can change it. Firstly, all the physical things in our society are essentially like, they've been imagined and then brought into reality. I mean, like things like roads, you know, didn't exist always, they're kind of like make-believe, um, things like chairs even. <laughs> okay, even something as simple as like the spoon had to go through the same process that the iPhone went through, in that someone had to tell the narrative and the story of this awesome utensil that could lift up food to our mouths and not spill. And same thing, like when the technology is available, I'm sure when the spoon was first brought out, people were like, oh, why would you want to use that? I would just keep using my hands, it's much easier. There had to be some human psychology and viral factors to convince people to use it. Now, I think the same thing occurs not so much just with our products, but also the things we do in life. I mean, most of our jobs these days are knowledge-based jobs. Why are they make-believed? Why are we doing like I was listening to a uh, podcast interview this morning with Mike Ken and Brooks of Atlassian, it's like a $5 billion startup that does SaaS-based products for team and project management, mostly for developers. I feel like there's something here, like the internet, all software, all apps, all websites, um, all jobs pretty much, because most jobs are knowledge-based, I feel like they're all make-believe. They don't really need to exist, they're just a story. Perhaps as we go up the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like once we've got our food sorted, our shelter sorted, our water sorted, our clothing sorted, we keep inventing these things for us to buy and these things for us to do in life to make us fulfilled. But when you're at that level, it's all make-believe, it's all a narrative that we've told ourselves that's really important and valuable, we must be doing this. I have a feeling we'll look back in 20, 30, 50 years and say 99% of all jobs were bullshit. But on the flip side of this, it means that if you kind of see the world that way, you see the world as, for what it is, it is most of what we do every day is bullshit, it's a narrative, then that means you can change that narrative. So I'm fascinated by the work that Edward Bernays did back in the early days. So he used his uncle, uh, Sigmund Freud, he used his learnings into human psychology to basically invent public relations and manipulate people's opinions about products. This is one story I remember, so back in the early days it was actually um, taboo for women to smoke. Um, and so obviously the, the cigarette companies wanted to sell to women because that could basically double their revenue. So what he did is he organized a bunch of reporters to be at this uh, specific parade, it might have been like Macy's Day Parade or something like that, um, and he also organized a bunch of suffragettes to basically pull out cigarettes at some point and smoke them. So Freud told uh, Bernays um, that the, the cigarette was somewhat akin to like, um, it was a symbol of power, it was a symbol of, a, a metaphor for like having a penis, which women didn't have, so that would give them power somehow. And Bernays then had the suffragettes, when they lit up, they called them torches of freedom. So then when all the press ran those stories, basically he equated like uh, women's rights with freedom with cigarettes. Somewhat evil now that we know that you know cigarettes are carcinogenic, but it's interesting that that was a way for them to sell the narrative to the masses. And it's a similar thing we do now with technology. We still have to sell the narrative. 
Now, in our current society, particularly with technology, like things like uh, VR, which is emerging right now, I feel like people are already accustomed to that narrative, so that's an easy one to sell. People will all, you know, get the idea of VR. The big question I'm trying to work out how to answer is how do you break a narrative? How do you transition people out of one narrative they're born into, institutionalization, and transition them to a different narrative? Because we're all born into like these institutionalized narratives that we kind of think of as unchanging, as real, as true, as serious, as like, you know, we live in these, they're very important to us. <laughs> so just a few of those are like our centralized governments, you know, these few people at the top telling everyone else how to live, um, things like the traditional education system, things like jobs, things like um, killing animals for meat. So I've talked about this a lot, but I feel like um, uh, jobs, like the traditional nine to five job, is one of the biggest things holding back humanity and human progress, because it's one of those institutionalized narratives we're born into and we accept. I feel like if people weren't spending most of their waking life at you know, jobs where they're just doing bullshit things, uh, they would actually find more happiness in life and they'd actually pursue passion projects. So if we could actually work less and still have all of our needs covered, um, that'd be awesome. Then we have that time to go and you know, pursue the passion projects to enjoy life. This is why I love a basic income so much. But I feel like a basic income is only going to happen where two ways, via a some type of like technological automation shock, like too many people unemployed and the government will have to pay everyone top down, or bottom up over 20 years via the blockchain. That's why I feel like a more practical, pragmatic approach is to basically like enable anyone to work wherever they want on whatever they want um, and only have to work 20 hours a week to meet all their basic needs. And yeah, there's a bunch of freelance platforms out there right now, but most of the time you're competing against people who are willing to work for 5 or $10 an hour because they're in third world countries, and so you're not going to get down to that 20 hour a week lifestyle. And in addition to that problem, plus the whole two-sided market issue, you've still got to break that narrative that people are born into, that jobs give you self-worth and value, and that you know you have to work hard to actually get somewhere in life. And this is very evident in the fact that like, whenever I tell people about a basic income or I tell them, like, you know, if I gave you $10 million, what would you do with your life? They don't know. They're like, oh, I'd probably just keep doing what I do now. That's scary. So yeah, that's my long ramble. I'm not sure if there was anything valuable in there. Hopefully there was. Hopefully something made sense. Let me know your own thoughts at Future. What strategies can we use to break these narratives?